Hi, everyone. Um, this is Jillian Thiel with ProBonoNet. So I'd like to note that today's training is presented by ProBonoNet in partnership with LSNTAP and the Northwest Justice Project with funding provided by an LSC TIG grant. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Miranda Watkins. Hi, everyone. Again, um, this is Miranda Watkins. I'm here to welcome you to Beyond, Beyond Online Intake, looking at triage and expert systems. So thanks for joining us today. Um, we have a great panel lined up, and I'm looking forward to learning a lot. So I'm the Law Help Interactive Program Coordinator at Pro Bono Net, and I'm going to be the moderator. I'd like to introduce our presenters today as well. They are Mike Grunenwald, who is the Senior Project Specialist at DC Bar Pro Bono Program. We'll also hear from Gwen Daniels, Director of Technology Development at Illinois Legal Aid Online. Um, next joining our panel is Gordon Shaw, Executive Director of Massachusetts Justice Project. And we'll also hear from Liz Keith, um, who will present on the New Mexico Legal Aid Triage Project. And Liz is Program Manager at Pro the Law Health Program Manager at Pro Bono Net. Um, so today we're going to start things off with a proposed definition of triage and online intake and explore how they're related. Um, these concepts, of course, have different meanings to different people, different organizations, and fields and contexts. So you may hear some of these varying definitions as panelists talk about their relevant projects. We'll also explore how online intake and triage might be helpful to members of low-income communities and other communities facing legal issues. Um, we're going to take a look at changes and in development in intake and triage in the legal services context and examine technology's role in these changes. You'll hear about expert systems, for instance, and how they have allowed organizations to create more sophisticated and agile intake and triage systems. We will have time for questions and comments um, between each speaker, and you can ask your questions and make your comments uh, via the chat. OK, so as mentioned, um, there are a number of different definitions for triage in the legal services and courts context. Um, in a recent publication entitled Triage Protocols for Litigant Portals, a coordinated strategy between courts and service providers, um, the authors describe triage as being something distinctly different in the legal context than in the medical contents, um, context. They assert that it does not prioritize resources to certain litigants over others to the extent that it leaves um, some untreated. Rather, it's a process of rational distribution of resources based on litigant need and case complexity to assure all litigants have equal access to justice. In other words, triage should be designed to sort resources and people to enable the most just, accurate, and efficient result for all. Intake can be described as the process of deciding what clients will be accepted by a legal services provider based on articulated criteria. And intake um, can include data collection, uh, review, acceptance, or denial of services, and referrals. Intake can be done in person, by telephone, and via the web. In its standard 4.1 for the provision of civil legal aid, the American um, Bar Association urges organizations to design and operate intake systems that treat all persons seeking assistance with respect um, to accurately identify their legal needs and promptly determine the assistance to be offered. Um, these same standards require that agencies be quick in responding to applications for services so that the person can seek alternatives if they're determined and eligible for a particular organization's services. Um, um, could, also could you speak up a little bit? We've got a few requests in the chat. OK, sorry. Um, can you hear me OK now? Um, there are a few other ABA standards um, that may be applicable um, to application for services in the civil legal context, um, including new model rules on technology-enabled services. And we provide it, we'll provide links to these standards in our resource slides. Um, so online intake can be viewed as the combination of an online application tool and an online intake system. Um, an online Intake application is an online form that collects information. It can also be an email. And it just basically refers to application um, that is received through some online tool. An 
online intake system is the online application and the, all the other components or resources that are required to process the application. So this can include staff, a database, a staging air, area that's not integrated into a regular case management system, a callback queue, and web chat to support the application. Um, so here's just uh, some lists of uh, technology tools and associated websites that can be used for online intake and triage. It's not an exhaustive list, but this is um, some uh, tools we wanted to just highlight and mention. So there's A to J Author, um, which is a software tool that delivers greater access to justice um, for self-represented litigants by enabling non-technical authors um, from the courts, clerk offices, legal services programs, and website editors to rapidly build and implement customer-friendly web-based interfaces for document assembly as well as online intake. Um, Neoto Logic System is an expert systems development and delivery platform. Um, expert application developed with Neoto Logic can be embedded in business systems or on a website or consulted interactively in a browser, computer, or smartphone. In addition, Neoto Logic software enables people who are not trained as programmers to develop precise and personalized um, interactive applications using a variety of reasoning methods. Form Router is a tool that can be used for secure e-form data collection. Um, it's been used by Legal Services Alabama for its online intake system. In Alabama, Form Router provides a PDF document with a fillable fields and then imports the information into Legal Services Alabama's uh, CMS or case management system. Um, there's also Wufu, which is a web application that helps users build online forms and can be used for online intake and to screen cases. Um, and this is being done in Massachusetts and Texas. So you'll hear more about New Mexico's legal aid triage project in this presentation. Um, but I just wanted to take a moment to highlight newly um, TIG-funded triage projects and online intake projects. So in addition to New Mexico, um, there's a project in Maine and Montana um, for triage. Online intake also um, includes online, I'm sorry, TIG funded online intake projects this year um, are in development in Arkansas, Florida, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, and Vermont. And you can visit LSC's uh, TIG site for a full list and description of these projects. Um, so I mentioned briefly the ABA best practices standard for intake systems. Um, you can access the full standards um, by visiting the link displayed. And these uh, slides and resources will also be available in the LSNTAP um, site. We'll be posting it there if you want to refer to it there. Um, you can also check out this blog post entitled ABA Model Rules. Um, revisions include technology, what attorneys must know. Um, there's a few other articles that are helpful in thinking about triage and online intake. Um, they include a recently released article, Triage Protocols for Litigant Portals, a Coordinated Strategy Between Courts and Service Providers, um, which I quoted to define triage. Um, it was prepared by Tom Clark, Richard Sorza, and Catherine Altenator. You can also read uh, Richard Sorza's article, The Access to Justice Sorting Hat Towards a System of Triage and Intake that Maximizes Access and Outcomes. Um, you may want to check out the Harvard Journal featuring Technology to Enhance Access to just Justice, which is a group of white papers that were presented at LSC's 2012 Summit on Technology and Access to Justice. Um, this, these slides, as mentioned, as well as um, other resources are available in the LSNTAP uh, library, um, including the recordings and materials from previous online intake community trainings. Um, and if you're interested in starting a triage or online intake project in your state as part of your process, you can reach out to Claudia Johnson, who's the Law Help Interactive Program Manager, um, who'd be happy to explore the best tool and path, depending on what you have in mind. Um, so that's sort of the introduction. I'm going to turn things over to um, Mike Grunenwall, who will talk about um, triage in DC, unless there are questions. And I can just uh, look in the chat box. Give me one moment.
Um, so there doesn't appear to be any substantive questions at this point. Um, so I'll turn things over to Mike. Hi, everybody. This is Mike Grunewald. As uh, Miranda said, I am the a senior project specialist at the DC Bar Pro Bono Program. Um, just to give a little background on where I come from to get to this point, uh, I actually started working with the Pro Bono Program on law help and on a document assembly projects when I was a law student at Georgetown back in 2008. And I've worked with them on and off after a, uh, a brief uh, misguided stint in big law. I came back and I uh, have resumed my work with Pro Bono Program. And, I'm excited to talk to you today about a couple of projects that are not finished, um, that still have quite a ways to go, but that we are uh, we're working on right now, and we're hoping will uh, serve as models for um, other program provi other uh, providers in DC uh, as ways of using technology. Um, so I want to point out first that the pro bono program is not an LSC funded program. So. Uh, I think if anybody out there is not an LSC funded program and you're kind of coming out this wondering how can I do this if I don't get TIG money, um, I hope I can give you a little bit of guidance on that. Uh, it's not scientific by any means, but I hope it'll maybe give you some ideas. Um, and so basically I'm going to tell two stories. Uh, and they're both, both stories hinge on partnerships that we have forged with Georgetown Law and with Neota Logic. And both Georgetown Law and Neota Logic have graciously given us support uh, Georgetown Law in the form of law students and Neota Logic in the form of giving us access to their software and other technical support, um, without which we couldn't really do any of this. So uh, I think the, if there is a lesson to take away for non-LSC programs, and even for LSC programs, if you have access to law students, they are free labor. And you would be surprised that how many of them have uh, technical aptitude. Um, I'm actually, I'm not going to talk about this project, but I'm actually working on another project with a law student at Georgetown who is actually a software programmer in his former life. So you'd be really surprised. Uh, a lot of law students aren't coming at it straight out of undergrad, uh, and some of them who are have significant programming experience. So try to create relationships with your local law schools, and, uh, and I think you'll find you'll get a lot of interest. Uh, Georgetown Law, obviously, in, D in D.C. is just one of the law schools, one of the many law schools uh, in the area. So uh, this is a great start, but I'm also hoping that we can create other relationships with uh, some of the other major law schools in the area. So uh, first I want to talk about the, uh, the first project, and this is our Consumer Debt Bankruptcy App. And this actually began as a document assembly project. I uh, was working with a managing attorney in our program uh, who wanted me to develop a, uh, a document assembly app, and, and it would actually it would have been based on A2J Author using Hot Docs, a sort of a standard document assembly app, to help creditors generate no contact letters because under federal law, uh, sorry, <laughs> not creditors, consumers generate no contact letters. Uh, because under federal law, consumers have the right to tell their creditors to stop harassing them. Um, so we wanted to to create a tool that people could use to generate these kinds of letters. We thought we'd make it a little smarter than that and also help them determine if they're judgment-proof, because if you're judgment-proof, you also want to tell your creditor that as well. Uh, you're wasting your time by harassing me because you're not going to get anything out of me. So. The interview, uh, as it was originally conceived, was going to collect some basic financial information from the consumer to determine, you know, in a fairly straightforward way, whether this person was judgment proof. I mean, if they have more debts than they have assets, uh, you know, or they had no collectible assets, then essentially, uh, you know, there was no reason for the creditor to keep coming after them. So this, that was our initial solution. As we thought about it further, and circumstances sort of conspired, uh, we determined that we can actually do quite a bit more with this. And, and this is where I think the storytelling comes in, because I, I just I don't remember exactly how this happened, but I ended up getting a call from a professor at Georgetown Law, and she said that she had students who had learned how to use Neota Logic through her seminar, uh, and, and they were really itching to do some additional work. And she had one particular student who was looking to do an externship, and would I be interested? And as soon as I, I got that uh, contact, I, I realized, wait a minute, we could probably do something even more substantial with this app than we originally thought. So the expanded thought was to hook this into our bankruptcy clinic, because 
we're thinking, you know, we've got consumers sitting here answering questions about their finances. While you're here, why don't we also determine if you might be a good candidate for our bankruptcy clinic? And why don't we have you, the consumer, do some of the work for us? Uh, because it, collecting all the information necessary to uh, to counsel someone on bankruptcy is actually quite time-consuming, time as I'll show you shortly. Uh, so we thought this would be a good place to go. So moving on, uh, what we wanted to develop and what we ended up uh, starting to develop, and I, I should actually revise my story slightly, uh, the call that I got from the professor was actually about the seminar. It wasn't about the individual student. We'll talk about the individual student later. But she actually had a team of students who were interested in developing an app for us. And that's where uh, we got involved in this more expanded process. So we asked the students to start developing an app for us that would determine if the consumer was judgment proof and also suggest, given the information that the consumer had provided, that you know, if we collect a little bit more information, maybe we can help counsel you uh, about whether bankruptcy might be a good option for you, given just the objective numbers that you're providing. So this served as a pre-screening device for our bankruptcy clinic. And actually, if you can go back one slide, Miranda, uh, or Jillian, I'm not sure who's Miranda's controlling. If you can go back one, I just want to show real quickly the um, what the check sheet looks like. So we use a checklist in our in our bankruptcy clinic, and I've just given a real small screenshot here, but it's two pages long, and you can probably make out all the lines that go into filling out this checklist. And it takes upwards of 30 minutes to an hour of volunteer time in the clinic to fill out this checklist with a consumer uh, who's interested in, in possibly filing for bankruptcy. So we want the app, and, and what the app will ultimately do is take the information from the consumer and fill in the checklist so that the, the consumer, the debtor, however you want to think of it, can actually go to the clinic then with this sheet completed. And that cuts out a significant amount of staff time. Uh, it increases the efficiency of our service. It increases our capacity. It, it could just be a, a wonderful uh, boon to the service that we're providing in the clinic. So. That's ultimately where we see this app going. Now, if you can advance, uh, I'll talk a little bit about what the app does right now. Uh, so as I said, the, the app was developed by a team of Georgetown Law students. And I've just given uh, one quick screenshot. It's still very much in the draft stage. Uh, the students really focused on the substance of the law of bankruptcy. So what we're doing now is building on, on that and putting in more of the document assembly capability that we originally I uh, thought we would want to do with it. But the students did a great deal of work in studying up on bankruptcy law and formulating questions in a very straightforward, plain language way to collect the information necessary to determine if this debtor might be a good candidate for bankruptcy. And uh, so the, the students used Neota Logic, uh, which is an extremely flexible platform. Um, it, it runs in HTML, um, so it, it's able to be run on desktop as well as mobile. Um, and one nice thing about Neota is that at the end of the process, after you go through the interview, it does a sort of document assembly in the sense that it creates a report for, for the user. And the report is intended very consciously to be directly responsive to what the user says in the interview. Say, you told us this. This is you know, the information that you need as a result of what you told us. So uh, I didn't include that in my screenshots just because it's not quite ready uh, for consumption. But I, I think it's a really neat feature about Neota that, uh, that you get this report. And it's very highly customized. Uh, the user can walk away with this document, you know, email it to themselves, et cetera. It, just, it, it really, I think, is a nice resource. And it's, it's very highly customized to that individual. And I think that was one of the principles upon which Neota Logic developed this platform was uh, you know, to, to really, really be responsive to the individual uh, and, and try to really provide some sort of an um, uh, empathetic, uh, responsive kind of a platform for people to use. So we're continuing to develop this app. Um, I don't exactly know when we can expect to have a beta version out, um, just because I am kind of the only guy in DC <laughs> who's working on this stuff actively right now. So. Um, <clears throat> But we do continue to have support from Neota Logic as we develop this. 
So I, I should I continue, Miranda, or should we answer questions right now before I start talking about the second project? Um, there is one question specifically about the bankruptcy app, if you'd like to answer it. It's, um, oh, how did, yeah. How did you do yeah, this? Yeah, this Oh, go ahead. I, I'm sorry. Yeah, how did, how did we... Definitely help. Yeah, uh, so the question is, how do we deal with state-specific property exemptions, or is this just for use in D.C.? Um, I have to say up front, I am not a bankruptcy law substantive expert. Uh, the students actually became sub substantive experts in the process, uh, but this was designed specifically for D.C. Now, that's not to say that this isn't something that could be used in other jurisdictions, but it would clearly have to be customized. Um, so you would have to have someone who knows how to use the Neonologic platform. Um, but I, I think by the same token, the, the folks at Neonologic have been very forthcoming with, with help uh, for us uh, pro bono so far. So um, I obviously can't speak for them to say whether that's what they continue, you know, what they plan to continue to do if other jurisdictions pick this up. But yeah, at this point, the app is specifically designed for DC. Um, so. I, but that's, that's the same things right now. Can't say exactly what the future holds. If this were a TIG project, I think the answer would probably be different because you, you go into a TIG specifically thinking, you know, this, this should be uh, portable to other jurisdictions. But because of the nature of our work, that kind of forces us in a way to, to limit our, our view. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to expand. Um, and then there's another question. What is the annual cost for Neonologic? Are there change costs? I don't know. Um, I, I think the people to answer that would be uh, the people at Neonologic. And, and part of the reason I don't know that is because I, they have done everything for free for us so far. So I, um, I don't know. I'm sorry. I wish I had an answer to that. OK, not seeing any other questions. I'm going to go ahead and, and go on to the, second, um, to the second project. And I'm going to have to talk a little bit faster. Uh, I apologize. Um, so, yeah, I mean, one last thing I should say about the bankruptcy app is that, uh, you know, we, we aren't using online intake in D.C. I, I, I'm not aware of an organization that's currently using online intake. There may be one. I just don't know. There's, there's so many legal services organizations just in, in the city alone. Um, our program in particular is not yet using online intake. So my thought from a programmatic perspective was if we could develop something that helps improve the efficiency and capacity of our bankruptcy clinic, we could use that as a model then to convince our program as a whole to, to look into online intake and then hopefully take that out uh, into the community and say, look how great this is. You know, you can use it for your clinics, uh, you know, or you can use it for your program. So uh, we're kind of coming at this from a different perspective. Uh, we're not at the online intake stage. I know a lot of you are. You, you've already done online intake, and now you're looking at how to, to do more with it. We're actually trying to, uh, to cultivate a, a new culture that accepts online intake as the standard. So that's kind of what we're, uh, that's, that's the vision going forward. OK, so moving into the second project, uh, this one also kind of happened by accident. Uh, it, in the sense that I was working very hard on the uh, on the launch of the new Law Help website, which I've, I've just given a, a pretty little screenshot here of of what our front page looks like, and just to illustrate the fact that, as many of you know, the way that you search for things in Law Help is either by doing a text search or by digging through the folders and the subfolders. And I got to thinking about what that means from a user's perspective, and it means basically that you have to have the words already. You have to know. Uh, that you are interested in bankruptcy and, and, and know where to find that in the site. Uh, you know, maybe you won't know immediately that it's, it should be under the consumer section, right? You may not know that debt collection should be under the consumer section. You may not know uh, that maybe domestic violence would be under the, the family law section. You could do a text search for that, but th I think the important thing about that to realize is that you get a list of resources. And so even if you have kind of the basic vocabulary, you still have to dig through the list of resources to find the thing that speaks directly to your issue and the reason that you've come to the site that particular moment. So I got to thinking, uh, you know, how can, can we come up with a better way to, to help people find what they're looking for? And this leads to a little anecdote that I'll try to tell very quickly. 
Um, if you can move to the next slide, Marina, that'd be great. Um, so the challenge was, you know, can we? Oh, my my uh, my image isn't showing. Well, there's supposed to be an image here of a washing machine, and and this is the story. Uh, I was thinking about Law Help and, and the new site, and you know, is, is there some other way we can enhance the way that users find information? And it just turns out that uh, my wife was expecting twins, and we were trying to find a new washing machine. And uh, so I was searching online for uh, for a new washing machine. And I, I was on a big box store's website, and they had this thing called an appliance finder, which I'd never seen before. And it actually asked me a series of questions. It was like a, an, it, was, it, was, it was an interactive interview. It asked me what features I was looking for. Um, you know, it actually presented me with options that I didn't even know existed at the time because I don't know how long it had been since I searched for a washing machine. And at the end, it actually presented me with washing machines that matched the the preferences that I had stated previously in the interview. And it occurred to me uh, later on down the line that this could be a model that we could use for law help. And uh, the the word that we've adopted is, I'm not sure exactly, it may have actually been uh, Neonologic who came up with this, but the idea of a concierge, where we actually ask our visitors, you know, why are you here? Uh, you know, tell us a little bit about why you're here, and then maybe we can help you find exactly what you're looking for, so you don't have to sift through all of the resources. And, and this is why I, I think of this as a triage app in the sense that we are trying to really narrowly directs people to the resources that are most relevant to them, rather than just giving them a mass of things to search through when they probably don't have the time, um, may not even have you know, the, the concentration of it, the skills available to do that, or the capacity at that point to do that, you know, especially if they're in a dire situation. So let's, let's try to make this more user friendly and, and a little bit more directed. So, so the, the thought here was to create a, a sort of an online st or an intake style interview where we ask really fact-based questions that you know, tell us what the user, basically what their issue is, and then present customized results. So this again comes back to the report idea that Neotologic is based upon where the, the interview will actually at the end say, well, based on what you've told us, these are the resources that might be most useful to you. Uh, and we're, we're not sure exactly what this will look like. Uh, I, I think at the beginning it will, it will very much resemble just a, a list of search results, but our goal is to present something that is really highly focused. So if there's a particular FAQ in a set of you know, 10 or 15 FAQs, that eventually we'll be able to pick that out of the FAQ and present it in the report so that the user doesn't have to go back and dig through this whole set of FAQs to find what they're looking for, because they've already done all the work. Why should they have to do it again? So that's where we think this is headed. And, and it just, I, I think it could really help maximize the efficiency of our users' visits to the site. So we decided to start small. And this is actually where my phone call with, with the professor from Georgetown came in, uh, if you can advance this the slide, Miranda. Uh, we decided to start with one subtopic, uh, which we thought was small. Um, as we learned very quickly, we were wrong. Uh, it, but we decided to start with our, div our divorce and enrollment subtopic, which is by far the most popular topic in, in our law help site, and relatively speaking, had you know, a small number of resources, 27 or so, uh, for the whole subtopic. And we had an externship student who uh, volunteered to develop the initial draft, uh, and he had to become a subject matter expert. He had to read all of the resources and develop the questions uh, in a way that you know connected with the resources appropriately. Um, he only had one semester, and and he was an extremely busy student, but he did a great job considering the time constraints that he was under. Uh, so we now have a a an alpha draft essentially where. Uh, we're going to continue to build upon it and and determine you know what Neotologic can do for us going forward. But they have also you know, graciously uh, offered their support going forward. So uh, so if you have the opportunity to to work the, with Neotologic, you know I, I would recommend it because they're really highly motivated to to provide support and they think this work is really important. Um, so let's see. I, just because I'm about out of time, I don't want to cut into other presenters' time. Uh, let's just flip to my last slide. I just want to talk real briefly about the lessons we've learned. 
And, and I indicated that we thought we were taking a small step, hence the astronaut picture, sorry. Um, I was a little delirious last night when I put this together. Um, but it turns out that taking a small step is not easy. Again, this is, I think, why the astronaut picture is apt. Um, we, this requires an immense amount of time. Um, it requires that you have someone who's willing to either, who is already a subject matter expert and is willing to give their time uh, to support this project, or you have someone like a law student who is really itching to learn something new, and you get them involved, and they're able to learn some new substance of law so that they can um, so they can apply that to this kind of a project. Uh, the second important lesson, especially from the concierge app, is we realized that once you start asking questions about one particular issue, you may actually be able to identify other issues that the user isn't aware of. Uh, one great example of this is if someone comes to our site looking for information on divorce, and we find out that they're also experiencing domestic violence, they also need resources about domestic violence. Um, because if that's part of the reason why they're seeking divorce, then they also need help with that issue as well. In addition, uh, in D.C., uh, domestic violence can actually have an impact on, on your housing rights. Um, so you can't be evicted because you're a victim of domestic violence. Uh, so if we discover that a certain set of facts applies to this user, we can actually start to branch out and identify other implications that arise from that set of facts. So that's, uh, I, I think, an important lesson to learn. And it gives us the ability to make this truly an expert system because it will start to realize connections where the user doesn't already see them. Uh, and then just to wrap up, you know, kind of our long-term delusions of grandeur for this project, or uh, maybe just my delusions, we'll, we'll see. Um, I, I want this to eventually be a, a law help wide app. And, and I'm not saying I want to impose it on other law help jurisdictions. I mean for law help DC. Uh, I want this to be something that applies to all of our topic areas. Uh, this is a very long project, I can tell, uh, but I, I think eventually that's where it's leading. And uh, I think we can also think of this as the first step towards turning Law Help DC into a one-stop shop where you know our members of our community come in, they get information, but we also determine that you know we can help them uh, in other ways by giving them referral information that's directly responsive to their issues and and hopefully then providing a gateway to intake. So again, we're kind of coming at this from a different perspective because we don't have the culture already in place to do online intake, but I think that's the logical extension of this project and where I, I see it leading. So if there are if there are any questions, I, I don't see Miranda, do you see any additional questions? I don't see uh, any more questions at this point. We could take just a few moments if anybody has a question. Um, OK, here's one. What are you doing? What you are doing is creating a more interactive portal type place for those looking for legal help. Is that correct? That, I think, is that that's the principle that we're operating on. I don't want this to replace what's already there in law help. I, I think you know, not everyone needs this kind of support. Some people know exactly what they're looking for, and they, they can very easily target what they want. They, you know, they know the search terms. So the idea here was to help those who need the most help. So, uh, so someone would come to the site and have this as an option. Um, if, if they want to have the directed, more personal touch, they can have that. If they want to do you know, more independent work on their own, they can do that as well. Um, and I think this goes to the next question. How do you see people choosing this option? How will you get them to do it? <laughs> Two different questions, for sure. Um, how do I see people choosing this option? Obviously, it's going to be self-selected. Uh, we're not going to make this the only way to access information on law help. It will be presented as an option. And, and I think, you know, given I, I, we may have to do a little bit of reconfiguration on our home page to, to make this a prominent option. Uh, but again, that, that's something down the road. I think we still need to build the, the back end uh, before we get into the, the real specifics about the user experience. How will I get them to do it? How will we get people to do this? Um, I don't know. I, I, I think it, it will depend on the particular user. Uh, if they're really pressed, uh, you know, if they don't understand what their problem is and, and they really 
you know, they really want to have someone to talk to in a sense, this can kind of serve that purpose. Um, because there, as everyone knows, there's a dire shortage of uh, people to talk to who know, you know, how to direct people to the right resources. So uh, I, it's, it's very much going to be self-selected and self-motivated. And then, um, and, and we'll see. I mean, we're obviously going to run some pilots to make sure that people will, a will actually use it if it's available. Um, I, I don't see us spending years and years on this if, if it's, uh, you know, not something people are going to adopt. Um, oh, okay, one more question. How will this be different from live chat? Uh, I meant to mention live chat is an obvious option here, right? A lot of jurisdictions are, are thinking about that. Since we're not TIG funded, or since we're not LSC funded, uh, and TIG is not really in our near future, live help isn't really much of an option for us, not only because of the money, but also because of the staff uh, time that it would take to develop that. So uh, it would very much be similar to live chat um, or, or live help in, in that sense. But I also think it could be more uh, in that it can make automatic decisions based on the sorts of information provided um, to direct people to document assembly that's appropriate for them or referral information that's appropriate for them in a way that maybe a volunteer who doesn't have all of the information ready to hand wouldn't know necessarily. So the nice thing about an expert system is that once you tell it what to do, it will do that every time, uh, assuming the code is sound. So, um, so it, it's kind of the same principle as live help, but uh, it, it's different in the sense that it doesn't require as much staff time going forward. It, it could conceivably go on for years and years and, um, and not require new staff. So we'll see. I mean, this is still, still in development, so we'll see exactly what happens. Um, Oh, I didn't realize that the fall Iron Tech competition is going on today. And, and just to mention this, uh, the Iron Tech competition is where the students from uh, from Professor Rustain's seminar all present their apps, and they they're judged by experts uh, from the DC community. And uh, just to toot my team forward, they actually won in spring 2013. So I was pretty proud of them for that. Uh, but if you have a chance to check out the web the webcast of the things that they did in the spring, or of the projects that are being presented uh, currently, I would recommend that you do that because you'll, you'll see some really interesting things. And they are interested in making this a nationwide model. So please, you know, contact Georgetown uh, if you if you want help because I think they're going to be really willing to to support you. So. Great, thanks. Mike. Sorry, I went over. <laughs> no worries. Um, so thank you, and thank you for answering those questions. And we're going to keep things <coughs> moving. Um, we're going to hear from uh, Gordon next. Hi, everybody. Um, first, let me just start with the sound check to make sure I successfully unmuted myself. Um, can someone say you're hearing me? We can hear Hello? you well. Thank you. Great, great. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to pick up on the theme of this webinar, which is uh, beyond online intake, and start with uh, just a uh, an intake timeline. And if you're still in control, Miranda, of the slides, is that correct? Yes, thank yeah. you. So uh, I think this helps to sort of put in context uh, what my project is about and also helps to explain uh, more generally how we got to where we are today in terms of issues coming through in terms of doing efficient screening and efficient intake. Um, now let me just say that this is, this is a, um, a, a loose outline or a loose timeline of how intake has progressed through the years, um, and there may obviously be outliers to this, but my sense of things was back in the, before the 90s that there was a lot, there was emphasis was put on having a lot of satellite offices and, and a lot of emphasis was put on having uh, intake done live face to face with people coming into the office and making appointments. Um, in the 90s, things changed. Um, intake became phone-centric, and there were a lot of uh, forces that sort of moved things in that direction, uh, not the least of which was so LSC restrictions. Um, this was the age of, uh, of the dawn of hotlines. My program, Mass Justice Project, we were created in the 90s as a result of the federal LSC restrictions. Um, and we were a hotline. We were a call center. Um, we uh, handle a high volume of, uh, of callers uh, uh, daily. Um, and so let me just ask sort of rhetorically, I know with over 80 people on this call, there are probably many intake 
Uh, managers, programs that deal with high, with high, have a high volume of intake and they're probably using call centers to do this. How well has that worked for you? Um, I'll just share with you some statistics from um, 2011 for my program. I consider 2011 to be a high watermark in terms of volume. Um, you know, we had over 30,000 callers to our to our hotline queue, um, but my phone data shows that we were only answering about 45% of those calls. So we were losing more than one out of two callers um, who were trying to get through on our hotline. A lot of that has to do with resources. Um, and I can tell you that while 2011 was the high water mark, both in terms of volume and my staffing, today I'm about 70, 70 staffing wise, I'm about 70% of what I was in 2011. So I think for a lot of programs, the, the, the emergence of online intake became sort of a partial solution to the access problem that phones created. Uh, so programs started developing these online systems. We, um, as Justice Project, launched an online system in 2000 and uh, early 2012. Um, and it's working well. It's actually it's producing uh, great access. It's, it's, it's producing good information that's coming through, information that we can work with and make decisions on who we can help. However, um, but what you've done by creating this uh, this web-based access system is that you you you, you potentially have made the problem worse in terms of access because now you've got people who can con there's no way to control the people co um, uh, contacting your program through your online systems. Um, so um, my project is is uh, and we can advance to the next screen. So we're at the age now where we're, we're thinking about creating client-centered or web-based triage tools, these expert systems that help the client or the, or the applicant coming into your system figure out where they can get help. And so that's the basis for that. That was the genesis of this TIG project that we applied for in 2012. And you can skip to the next screen. So 2012, we applied for a TIG, and we were funded to develop what we're calling the Massachusetts Legal Resource Finder. And what is it? It's a, a web-based tool that will connect low-income persons to the Massachusetts legal resources that correlate with their specific legal issues. Next screen. So why is it needed? And again, this sort of is uh, covering some of the same ground I just mentioned about the programs being flooded with requests for assistance. And um, most of those folks who are coming into your program looking for help, the, the vast majority of those people are got, probably going to be turned away with referral to self-help materials or other sources of assistance. You know, programs are stretched thin uh, in all aspects, but this also certainly extends to your screening, intake, and hotline resources as well. And here in Massachusetts, I'm just one of about 18 um, specific legal aid programs. And so we have a wide range of programs and also online resources to help low-income people with legal needs. And until now, there has, hasn't really been a centralized way to direct people to these resources. So the goal of my TIG project of this LRF, the Legal Resource Finder, is, is, is twofold. It's to give some relief to our overburdened intake systems while at the same time providing consumers with a quick and accessible way to find out what the resources are that can help them. So let's skip ahead. So how will it work? Um, well, first let me tell you that we, I'm going to, in just in another couple screens, I'm going to demo the site for you. Our site is just about to go live. But let me just sort of tell you in, in a narrative form how it will work. Um, the user is going to complete a short online form with a limited number of questions about their legal problem and household demographics. Then there will be a search, then a search of a database, uh, and it will produce a, 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 a result screen, which would include any of the following bulleted information. Uh, first and foremost, it'll tell people about which programs in their service, in, in, uh, in their area, uh, are accepting those types of issues for intake. Um, but it will also direct them to um, give them live links to online resources. And then thirdly, it will also help direct them to additional resources that may not necessarily be uh, a legal aid program, but um, projects that may exist to help people. A good example of that might be a lawyer of the day project in a housing court. Um, and I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Um, the, we are inviting all of our partner programs, all of the Massachusetts Legal Aid programs to participate in setting up uh, information on the um, Legal Resource Finder. 
and I will show you uh, next how all that works um, behind the scenes. So Miranda, if you want to give me control of the um, site, I can take you to the live site. Sure, give me one moment. So everybody at the uh, can you now see my screen, which has at the top Mass Legal Services. Welcome to the Massachusetts Legal Resource Finder. Is that showing? Yeah. Yep. Um, okay. So this is the site. It uh, actually it's not live yet. It, 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 we are we are hoping to go live next month with the site, but it's it's about ninety percent ready to go. There are still some things that we're still working on in terms of design and programming. But this is the page that. Um, Users will, will see when they first jump to the site. Um, and let me also just explain where this is. This is going to be hosted and be part of our one of our state legal information websites, um, uh, our legal help websites. And so it, 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 people who stumble onto that site will be directed, will be able to be directed to this site from that home page. But of course, programs we're inviting programs to also link to this site, uh, especially if they've got an online system um, from their intake page, uh, to be directing people to to go here first to sort of check out um, whether or not they may even they should even proceed with um, applying for legal aid with that program. But his page and uh, it asks for some some information uh, to help determine um, where you might be able to get help and the and first few pieces of information deal with geography, with location of where the client is, uh, age, because age is a, is a uh, screening factor for a lot of programs. And then we're also asking some information about household size and income. And we are not, this is not intake, so we're not actually collecting this information. It isn't saved anywhere. The, the reason we're asking for household size and income is to help steer away people who would be clearly over income for a program. Um, so then, uh, after you filled in that those little those pieces of information about yourself, we've got a whole lot of substantive areas um, where um, where if we link on any one of these, and let's just take abuse, harassment, and neglect, we have created lists of it specific issues that folks typically call legal aid about. Um, so here we have a series of things that relate to abuse, uh, neglect, uh, uh, harassment, and even here, uh, I am a survivor of domestic violence, and we even, we even have sometimes have sub issues um, that dig down deeper into what an issue may be. Um, let me just show you another one of these trees. Uh, so here we have. Um, uh, a series of problems related to consumer law. Um, so if you selected that and you hit search, you would then get a results page. But let me go back. I want to. I didn't put any of the initial information in. Um, let me show you the results in a eviction case. So say that somebody lives in Boston. Uh, I'm not going to make them old to si over 60, so I'm going to leave that blank. So say there's two people in the household and say their monthly income is $1,200. Now, please choose the issue you need help with. Um, and the way we organize this is to, is to have people first identify the type of housing that they're in. So they could be a homeowner or they could be a tenant. But even among tenants, we've broken it out into whether they've got a subsidy or not have a subsidy or, or whether they live in a mobile home or a group home, and even homeless individuals. But let's say our person is in public housing, and so you get a, then you get a whole bunch of additional issues that you can choose from. And let's say they're being evicted. And then we're asking them, how far along in the eviction are you? And let's just say this person has received their court summons but has not yet been to court. And you can see that we've broken it out, made a distinction between folks who are you know, pre-judgment and post-judgment here. Um, so we're clicking someone who hasn't been to court yet. So now, they're, now they hit search. And uh, what pops up are results for, their, for the Boston area programs that provide legal aid.
um, and we've got a number of them here in Boston, um, Greater Boston Legal Services, among others. Um, but um, also at the bottom, we've included links, live links to resources for the tenant um, who may be facing eviction, where they can go and educate themselves. And we've sort of created two types of we have two types of resources here. We have, we have specific resources that will help people with, an, with their actual eviction case, and then we have more generalized resources for folks as well. So we have links here to court forms. We have a um, ICANN uh, module here in Massachusetts so people can go and do their court forms. Let me go back and show you an example of where there, someone is not going to get uh, a match with a program. So let's do another search. Um, let's again do, say, let's say Springfield. Uh, the two people in the household, $1,200. And so I'm going to do a consumer issue. Um, and actually, let me back up for a second. Let me do debt collection. Uh, I have errors on my credit report and want to know how to fix them. That's typically not something a legal aid program would get involved in. Um, so here we're searching. And so uh, what pops up is that there is no match, um, no program that we've been able to identify to take your case for free. We do provide a sort of a default, a link to bar associations in Massachusetts where they possibly could get a referral to a private lawyer. But at the, again, at the bottom, we've given them links to resources that could help them uh, educate themselves about fixing their credit reports. So this is the uh, the consumer side, the user side of the um, of the of the uh, website. So let me just show you quickly the uh, what it looks like from the point of view of the program that's that's participating in this. So. We have update your pro. Uh, I'm logged in as an administrator. You would not see this as a user. This this information up here, um, but here, uh, as I said, we have a lot of programs in Massachusetts. So here we have already built into this uh, uh, all of the programs that provide le free legal aid services in Massachusetts. Um, so if you're a program and you uh, let's just start with uh, pick one of these programs. Let's just do community legal aid in Northampton. So you will you would go in and, and if you needed and set up your profile, set up your your information about your intake systems, give your website um, uh, for doing online intake, and if you want it, and then when you need to edit it, you go in and edit it this way. Uh, and then. And then an additional tab brings you over to selecting what your service area, what your poverty guidelines, what you want to set as your maximum poverty guideline, uh, what your service area is. And then you have the entire outline of these legal issues. And uh, the programs will go in and just select, ch put checks in, those issues for which they want to see a match to their program. And this is really, really, really convenient for programs who need, who may need to turn on and off intake uh, on a on a day's notice uh, because something happened, or where they want to add issues. Um, so only those issues which uh, provide a match will return as a result. Um, and it goes all the way through everything that that uh, we have close to 200 issues that we've identified on this um, site. So, I mean, that in, that's a very quick sort of tour of this site, um, and um, it was just my intention to sort of share with you what how how this site uh, is coming along. And oh, I should add that the site is being built with Drupal, um, uh, uh, a, a, a data management um, system. I think most of you are probably familiar with that. I'm not a programmer. I have uh, I'm using a, a programmer through the TIG to be able to build the, the rules that are that are helping to that are powering this search engine. So with that, I'll just leave it open to questions. Okay, thanks, Gordon. We have one question, so um, I'll read that out to you, but I think just in the interest of time, um, after that one question, we're going to transition to Gwen, and then if folks can save their questions to the end so we can hear the really great upcoming presentation. Um, so the question is, um, do the results provide civil code section excerpts related to their issue? What was that again? Provide what? Oh, no, we do not cite 
specific laws or regulations. You may find you may find that when you dig into some of the self-help resources, but not not on the site itself, not in the results page. Okay, great. Thank you so much, um, Gordon. So I'm going to go ahead and advance those slides for uh, Gwen. Hi, this is Gwen Daniels. I'm the Director of Technology Development at Illinois Legal Aid Online. Um, Illinois Legal Aid Online is a standalone organization that manages all of the, the four statewide websites in Illinois. Um, and the project that I want to talk about is the our can you go to that slide, Miranda? Is the is the Illinois statewide online access system? Um, it's a TIG project that began in January 2012. It's in live beta now. Um, in in select problem codes, um, primarily public benefits and mortgage foreclosure, through the three LSC programs in Illinois. Um, like Massachusetts, um, we are not an, an LSC an LSC funded organization, so the um, LSC programs will get TIG funding and then subcontract with us for technology development. Um, in addition to handling um, the select problem codes where we are open for both triage and intake, we also have a selection of sort of always divert problem codes where the triage is, is more invisible and it just um, directs the user away from the p programs and straight into self-help materials on IllinoisLegalAid.org. Um, in 2014, we'll be expanding it to include a, two non-LSC programs and um, support for both English and Spanish. Miranda, can you go to the next slide? And the, ne the next one. Okay. So why do we do pre triage before intake? The number one thing that we heard from the programs when we started talking about this project was that they they wanted the right case, more of the right cases, not more cases, and they don't want to keep having to tell people no. They spend half their time on the hotlines telling pro people that no, they can't help them. Um, their problems just aren't critical enough for the limited resources. And so we built the system with the idea of pushing high priority cases through and diverting everybody else to self-help resources on IllinoisLegalAid.org, whether that is legal content, automated forms, referrals to the legal self-help centers, um, which exist in every county in Illinois, or um, referrals to other organizations or to the private bar. Can you go to the next slide? Okay. So our system is a little different than, than a lot of the others, and, um, and there's, there's really three components. Um, first, there's an admin interface that's on the um, IllinoisLegalAdvocate.org, which is the statewide website for the, the legal aid programs. And it's similar to what Gordon just showed in that we allow each organization, and actually with the programs that have multiple offices, each office can go in and set system messages at a problem code level. They can open and close intake. They can set inc limits for income, for assets, for which zip codes or counties that they want to accept intakes for, and the number of intakes allowed. There's also a, a reporting module. On the statewide public website platform is where the user interface for both intake and triage exists. And the website then processes sort of responses from those rule engines um, and also handles the e-transfer uh, on intakes to a legal server, um, which is the case management system currently used by all three um, LSE programs in Illinois. The real heart, though, of the system is the Drules Rules Engine that holds all the logic for both triage and intake. Can you go to the next slide, Miranda? So a little bit about um, 
why this approach and, and why we use Drools. First, Drools is a free open source rules engine from JBoss, which is a, a part of Red Hat. Um, what, it, what it has allowed us to do is to give total flexibility over the logic to the programs. We had no way of getting every program, even the three LSE programs that we're starting with, and as we roll this out to other programs in the state, there's very little chance of getting everybody to agree on the same rules. And, and so what we've done is we've created sort of a master rules, and then each program has customized them um, for their own use. And they, they're basically just text files of when, then rules that say things like, when x is true, then ask this question, or when y is true, then send to Aleo or send to intake. Um, and we did it this way rather than use, you know, A to J or something else is we, for, for a variety of reasons. First, we wanted total control over the user interface. Um, we wanted it to look just like our website um, without a transition to something else if we could. Um, we use the Jewels Rules Engine over REST, which is just a, an XML-based protocol. It all happens on the back end. Um, we send data from the website to Jewels. Jewels sends back an XML packet as a response, and the website can't po processes it and updates the data package and the user interface. Um, second, we wanted the rules to be flexible and completely self-contained. You know, because we're not going to get program agreement, we wanted everybody to be able to do their own thing. But it's also completely separated from the user interface, which means if I blow up Illinois Legal Aid tomorrow and rewrite it in, you know, Ruby or .NET or something, I don't have to rewrite the logic piece of the um, triage and intake system. And finally, we wanted to be able to communicate between different statewide components. Um, right now, with, with this approach, we're able to interact with the search server that powers the website or the content database that has all the legal information, the referral database. Um, we can talk to various case management systems. Um, right now, we're publishing things out to legal server, but I can also publish out to anything else that will accept an XML or text file. Um, and down the line, we, we can continue to expand this um, to use any, to interact with any other API accessible service. Can you go to the next slide, Miranda? Okay. So this is what it, it looks like um, and how it works. And at the end, I will tell you how to go in and if you want to look at it yourself. Um, if intake is available for a particular legal problem code and zip code, then this yellow pop-up appears. Um, the user hits, says, no thanks. Um, they get a little graphic off to the side that lets them go back in. If they hit start, it then um, goes into the triage module. Um, availability is determined by the programs at the back end, in the back end. Um, if they have it set to open, if it's set, and if it has it maxed out. Um, and if it isn't available, then there's no pop-up appears at all. It's what we, we call it just falls silent. Um, if you go to the next slide. So this is what the actual, what, what one of the triage screens actually looks like. And in this case, it's somebody who is looking for um, help with a food stamp problem. And um, what happens is if they select the first option, was, or the first or the second option, um, I have not applied for food stamps, or I tried to apply for food stamps, but the agency wouldn't let me. Those are not priorities for the local programs. And so if they click either of those, they get sent to an exit screen, which contains referrals to other organizations and relevant legal content on IllinoisLegalAid.org. If they select anything else, they'll either get additional questions, or they will get taken into the intake module for LAF, and assuming that they are not over income or over asset, it will be e-transferred into legal server. And this allows us to filter out then and control the, really control the volume of intakes that get through to the programs and ensure that we're only sending sort of what we think are, are high, high quality um, cases to the program. 
Can you go to the next slide? Um, one of the other thing, one of the other things that uh, we've done is, is made sure that that we are trying to do our best to divert low priority cases, and there's, we've taken two approaches with this. One is what we call the always divert um, problem codes. If somebody searches for taxes in a Chicago zip code or traffic or criminal or something that the programs just don't do at all, they'll get what's up in the in the top corner here where it says on the referral page, LAF doesn't take these kind of cases. Please call one of the other agencies on this page for help. And hopefully that will send a message that they shouldn't that they're not going to get the help they need by calling. What you're seeing and and the big part of the screen is what happens when somebody hits um, in the previous screen, if they'd hit, I haven't applied for food stamps, this is the message that they would see. And what it is, is there's a, the, the top line is, hard, is really hard coded into the system. And then the rest of the text there is actually something that the programs are able to create for each triage option. And in this case, LAF is saying, if you haven't applied yet, we can't help you, but you can go to one of these addresses and we have staff there that will help you apply. And then there's additional organizations below and then on the um, right column there are a list of relevant related articles um, for food stamps. Here's the next slide, Miranda. So, this will be out of beta in early 2014, and we're already started to sort of think about what we're going to do next. Um, first of all, the, the deeper integration piece is something that we're, t we're thinking about letting, be, figuring out how to, instead of just letting programs do callbacks, you know, um, or please call us messages, actually figuring out how to actually integrate um, with existing scheduling systems, whether it be through the case management system or through Microsoft Exchange or through Google Calendar. Um, and also, uh, one of our projects this year is to rewrite our search engine on the public website, um, which will allow for even more refined integration with our content and referral databases. Um, as we expand this to other organizations, we start thinking about how we really truly state integrate this statewide so that if a user comes in and starts it down the LAS, the Legal Assistance Foundation tree, and gets to an exit to Aleo, it could seamlessly transfer them over to any other organization in the Chicago area that might be able to actually provide direct assistance before triaging them out. Um, and finally, we're looking at extended data analysis to sort of take this truly into an, an expert system level. Um, Miranda, can you go to the next slide? We got a TIG grant at the, that just started in January of 2013 to build a statewide collaborative data system. Um, and what it is, is there is a statewide instance of legal server, which we're currently using for the intake um, is the holding pin for online intake. But what it will do, we will be able to pass data from each of the, the organization's case management system and also from the statewide website into the single statewide instance of legal server. And what I'm hoping that we can get out of that is, the, is some data that we can use um, to sort of analyze and we find that the triage rules so that we're really pushing through the cases that we're actually going to take, the cases where we where we can actually have the best outcomes for the limited resources that we have. Um, for example, our current foreclosure rules for all three of the LSC programs basically say send anybody who lives in a foreclosed property through um, through to intake. But maybe a year from now, we go back and actually look at, you know, data from the case management systems, and it turns out that really we're only taking cases where X, Y, and Z are true. Um, then maybe it will help us to um, refine those rules so that we're triaging out to legal resources and self-help resources the folks who don't meet 
X, Y, and Z, and allowing intake only for those who the, the program would actually end up oh, directly representing. And the next slide, Miranda. And finally, if you're interested in looking at the online um, access system, you can go to IllinoisLegalAid.org and search for anything related to food stamps, TANF, Medicaid, or mortgage foreclosure. And I put a Chicago zip code up on the slide, as well as please use the test name of NTAP user if you get, or NTAP tester if you get to the intake module. That will prevent um, you from counting in the program limits. And um, the program limits and, or actually being e-transferred over to LIF. Finally, there's a, a link to um, the JBoss website with the link to the, the Drools engine. Because this is a TIG grant, we include it as one of our milestones, publishing um, documentation on how all of this works, um, how it could be replicated, and that will be out early next year. And again, in my email and my phone number, if anyone has has questions. Um, so one of the questions was, what type of uh, accessibility work has been done on this? Does it conform to Bobby 508 W3C standards? Um, generally, our website is is, five, is compliant, and, and the intake module is it's all HTML5, so it should be completely compliant. Um, the flash modules that are still on our website, and those will be replaced hopefully soon with um, HTML5 modules are are not accessible, but there are we do offer text only variations of those. So yeah, this should actually be fa um, fairly accessible. Great. Uh, thank you, Gwen. Um, yeah. There uh, may be a few more questions, but if we can hold those to the end of the presentation um, so we can have some time to hear from Liz. Great. Thanks, Marinda. Hi, everyone. I'm Liz Keith. I'm the Law Help Program Manager at Pro Bono Net, and I'm going to talk about a new triage project in New Mexico that is one of several that were just awarded TIG funding. And this is still in the very early stages, but I'm going to talk about what is planned and how uh, this project will hopefully build on the good work and lessons that Gwen, Gordon, and uh, Mike have shared today about uh, their projects. So um, as an overview on, on uh, the next slide, the lead agency on this project is New Mexico Legal Aid. Ed Marks is the executive director and was not able to be here today, but I've included his contact info along with mine at the end. And uh, the triage system that is planned will encompass services provided by New Mexico Legal Aid, which is the LSC-funded program, as well as five other legal aid agencies in the state, um, in addition to court self-help and pro bono resources. And the technology partners on uh, this effort include pro bono net and Neotologic System, the same uh, uh, outfit that Mike talked about at the beginning. And the, the um, goal here, uh, similar to I think some of the other models that we've heard about, is to develop a statewide triage system to help more intelligently guide litigants okay. to the program or resource best suited to help and lead to actionable results. And then in turn, help ensure that New Mexico Legal Aid and its partners are more likely to get cases that each program um, both has the capacity for and is well suited to help with and then ultimately be able to serve more people. And um, some of these issues, including uh, uh, just overall capacity and some of the volume issues that Gordon spoke about, are um, particularly acute in rural areas of New Mexico, which includes much of the state and um, areas where right now New Mexico legal aid attorneys are um, often faced with serving clients in multiple communities, sometimes spread over hundreds if not thousands of square miles. So um, looking at ways uh, triage can help uh, uh, increase access to resources and services and facilitate um, access for, for, for those people to the appropriate programs. So um, the project has several components that are talked about on the next slide, there will be an advocate-facing interview. Um, a 
version of that interview that will be adapted for the public. And then this project also will include the development of new self-help and legal education content that is delivered through the system. And then the uh, last component is a reporting service that will provide anonymized um, interview data to downstream systems in New Mexico in, in the future for analysis of case patterns. And um, this is a, a pilot project in New Mexico, but from the outset, uh, the, the kind of goal here is to put in place a technology platform and framework um, somewhat analogous to the National Law Help Interactive Document Assembly Server, um, so that assuming success of this pilot in New Mexico, similar triage systems can be created and hosted on this system for other states in the future. And um, it could also include sample canned or master rules that could help get programs started in this area and modify for local use. So I'm just going to talk through each uh, program, each, each project component briefly. The uh, triage tool for advocates is described on the next slide and will gather information about litigants and based on program priorities, uh, intake requirements, and um, language, other factors, help identify for the advocate what the most uh, uh, meaningful and um, cost-effective source for help is for that individual. So for example, pr um, proceeding to intake providing them information about an upcoming clinic or self-help resources or perhaps referrals to another agency. And then um, the, the, uh, as the first phase of this project, before any actual development begins, will be to articulate and develop an agreed upon set of questions and protocols uh, for the participating programs to um, help script and guide what the triage and referral rules will look like within this system. The triage interview for advocates will be um, adapted to create a similar tool that will be public facing. Um, and Brenda, if you can go to the next slide, uh, we anticipate that that public interview will be provided both in English and Spanish. And uh, the, the, the goal here is to really try to provide a one-stop kind of universal tool that can be available statewide to uh, help individuals diagnose their issue and quickly guide them to the most relevant resources and services, which might be um, self-help resources, FAQs, or links to interactive forms, or referrals to a legal aid agency for intake. And for those directed to intake, um, the system will offer information the user can um, review to prepare for their appointment, and a few next actions that will include uh, an email summary of the interview results and recommended actions that can be sent to the user's email address if, if they choose that option. Uh, that will also be available in um, print format to help the user prepare for their appointment at an agency or uh, also be available for an advocate to provide to a litigant during the intake process. And then what we anticipate that the system will also include the option to email um, a, a kind of standardized intake request, most likely in CSV format, along with a summary of the interview results to a recommended organization um, for uh, uh, reviewing and um, uploading into their case management system where appropriate. That won't be automated, but it will help um, facilitate that, that handoff. And then uh, one of the, the nice things about the Neotologic system is that the interview um, can be widgetized for embedding in other websites or systems. So this can be available not only on New Mexico Legal Aid's website, but also in the context of a, a social service agency website or um, within a, a public library uh, framework to help people uh, uh, learn about services and access self-help information regardless of what website or online system they're starting their search for help at. Um, 
the uh, technology approach here is, I've talked a little bit about this already, but there are um, a few major components. I, um, Miranda, if you can move to the next slide. I mentioned that we uh, will be using NEOTA logic system as the expert uh, and rules-based delivery platform. And um, one of the uh, nice things about that that I think um, Mike alluded to is, and is similar to what Gwen and Gordon described too, is that it will um, provide the ability for non-technical staff to modify the rules on the fly. And so, you know, regardless of what technology platform programs are considering, I think this is um, an important thing to look at. So if an agency is temporarily not accepting new cases in a particular area, um, the agency will have the ability to uh, modify that element in the Logic to route the user to the next best resource. And uh, the, uh, the, the initial drafting of the protocols will happen in um, Word or Excel, but then um, with some training and support, uh, initially can be uh, implemented by non-technical staff in the system. And as under this effort, NEOTA is providing um, considerable in-kind technology support as well as professional services to um, towards the New Mexico pilot, but also to work with ProBonerNet to establish uh, what we hope will be a, a essentially a national server running NEOTA logic system that can um, host and support interviews for other states in the future, as well as uh, consume API feeds from statewide websites in order to um, provide and deliver content, self-help resources, referral, other, other content from, from those sites through these interviews. So Gwen, Gwen talked a bit about um, next steps that Illinois is, is working towards. And while this uh, pilot in New Mexico is really just in the planning stages, some of the phase two opportunities, I, I think that um, the partners see here are similar to the uh, things that, that uh, Gwen and her project are looking towards. So ways in which um, this can be integrated more deeply with case management um, or uh, other downstream systems, um, potentially the ability down the road to uh, apply standard data visualization tools to um, be able to get a different view on the interview, the anonymized interview data that's coming in, and make adjustments to the triage rules based on that. Um, another possibility in the future might include an, uh, the ability, a, a sort of calendaring system that would provide um, the ability for a user to optionally uh, asked to be scheduled in to the next available appointment at an organization. And then um, also more extensive reporting interfaces to potentially um, provide or take in data from outside agencies and systems. So um, we hope to have the opportunity to share more about this um, next year as the project moves along and um, as uh, the, the Previous speakers have mentioned also develop uh, documentation and resources that can help support um, other states in developing similar systems, um, you know, uh, and thinking through how uh, to work with project stakeholders and, and partners in the, the planning and rule development process. I'll, I'll stop there. I think we're just about out of time, but I'm um, happy to answer any questions or uh, uh, Folks are welcome to follow up with uh, Ed or me by email as well. Uh, great, thank you, Liz. Um, as Liz mentioned, we're we're close to the end of the time for the webinar. But if you have um, questions, feel free to put them in the chat box. Also, in the chat box is the link um, to the survey for this webinar. So we'd love to hear from you. Um, otherwise, thanks so much uh, for joining us, and thank you. Um, to the panelists for your fantastic presentation. Thanks, Miranda. Thanks, Brian. Thank you so much for putting this on. Very, very popular topic. We may even have to divide this into um, two uh, different presentations next year because there are clearly a lot of people interested in it.